You know, church, there's really nothing like it. Singing, gathered together, the voices of the saints lifting high the name of Jesus. There's nothing like it. What a tremendous privilege it is to be able to meet week after week and to sing and to pray with you and to dive into God's word. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians chapter three, as we continue our walk through the book of Ephesians and our emphasis on church matters. Church matters, meaningful membership as we examine what God's word teaches us about the joining of ourselves together. Paul, for the second time in the book of Ephesians, gives us, in this case, two really long winding sentences in chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. This time he broke it into two sentences. It's long and it's winding. And I'm going to do something this morning that my seminary professor specifically told me not to do. They said, do not do this, but I'm a rebel. I'm going to do it. And that is, I I need to give you, I want to give you kind of a long introduction. I want to tell you what he says before we read it. That way, when we read it, it will make more sense. Now, the wall is back out. This was from last week. If you didn't uh, get a chance to see last week's sermon, you can go back and you can watch that. But it's important as we're walking through Ephesians for me to build this for us so that you understand. What happened last week was we saw in the temple formation that there were dividing walls that ultimately end up causing enmity, division between Jew and Gentile, between male and female, between priest and laity, okay? But in Christ, the dividing walls have been destroyed, demolished, right? When he died on the cross, the temple veil was torn in two. And what we saw is that in Christ, that uh, those of us who are in Christ are being formed into a new man, a new creation, a third race filled with the Holy Spirit, no longer Jew or Gentile, now united in one Holy Spirit, in one gospel, in one church being formed together. And no longer are the bricks now a dividing wall, but now rather we are the bricks filled with the Holy Spirit, and we are being formed into the temple of God that we are the temple. And the beauty of this picture of the temple is black, white, Asian, Hispanic, all being formed together into one temple, poor and rich and uneducated and educated and every dividing wall that exists in our culture are formed together in one temple picture. And it's a compelling picture. That which the world can't unite, Jesus unites in the picture of the local church. So whenever I refer to this, I'm talking about our compelling diversity that we are united in Jesus Christ and what we are called to formulate. All right, so that was last week. Now, in the, in the scripture passage we're about to read, Paul's going to refer to a mystery that has been hidden for ages past, this unfolding of God's plan. And what that mystery is, is this picture right here, that Gentiles are formed into the body of Christ, that in all of our diversity, the gospel will go out anywhere and everywhere, and call all to join together. So this mystery that Paul talks about is this picture of the local church. And now that the gospel goes out, instead of everybody having to come to God in Jerusalem, now the gospel goes out to anyone, anywhere. And as it does, it forms local churches and begins to unite that which was formerly divided. 
And Paul is so excited, he cannot believe that he gets to, because he used to persecute the church, now he can't believe that he gets to be known as the apostle to the Gentiles. He can't believe that the gospel is so good, that Jesus is so redeeming, that he, the least of all, gets to go out and preach the gospel and plant churches with his life, okay? Those two threads, the mystery and Paul talking about how excited he is to participate in it, will help you understand what Paul says here in Ephesians 3, 1 through 13. All right, so now let's read it together. It's on the screen. You can turn with me in your Bibles. Paul writes, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. So Paul writes this letter in prison said, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, okay, that is that he gets to be the apostle to the Gentiles, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery. Remember, this is the mystery, and he's going to say that in a second. As I wrote before in brief, By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, now he's going to define for us what the mystery is, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ And to enlighten all people as to what the plan of the mystery is, which which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things. Now pay attention to verse 10, because here's where we're going to camp out the rest of the sermon, all right? So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church, to the rulers and to the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory." Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we are so privileged. The Old Testament saints longed for our day when we could gather anywhere as your sons and daughters around your word to sing your truth and to pray together collectively as your body, as your bride, the living temple. God, we know that there is a special, unique, incredible power when we gather together and when we pray and when we sing that your Holy Spirit shows up in an incredible way. And we pause to praise you for that to thank you for that, the way that you minister to our hearts no matter where we are, the way that you lift our head, the way that you call us forward. Father, we pray right now this morning that you would help us to have a deeper understanding of your word and what you are calling us to be this morning. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, imagine with me, it's Sunday morning, but you don't have to wait for the alarm clock to go off off because the kids have already shook the bed and said, get up, get up, it's church day. 
The whole family dresses in the jersey of their favorite praise team leader with face paint on and a foam hand of praise. Dad, we've got to get there early so I can get my jersey signed and I can watch the choir and the band march into the sanctuary. The youngest squeals with delight. All week long, highlights from last week's sermon have been showing and playing on Church Center. Traffic is a nightmare. You have to park blocks away just to get a spot because of all the tailgating that has happened in the parking lot. But that's okay because you've built in extra time. This morning, you are early enough to sit up in the front row, in the front row. And one of them says, we can see the little beads of sweat build up on his head from up here. I sure hope the service goes extra long. It's my favorite whenever we go into extra time. (laughs) You say, Pastor, that was pretty funny and cute until you started talking about it going extra long. That is over the line. That's too much. Now, you know, I'm just trying to be funny, but pause for a moment. Why do we do all that and more for a football game? You say, it's fun. Well, it's even deeper than that. See, truthfully, there is a community, there is a fellowship, there is this connectiveness whenever you gather together and you cheer for your team. But also, we would say, there's an importance to it. It matters. There's nothing quite like quite life affecting the outcome of a game. When, when all the fans gather together, cheer in unison, shout in unison, and affect the outcome of a game. Now, I went to Texas A&M. There you go. I can always get my whoops. Where we are known as the home of the 12th man. True tradition that every student stands the entirety of a football game. Now, this this tradition is passed down because it's actually a true story that in the 30s, uh, when football teams were a lot smaller in number, there happened to be so many injuries that occurred on the field at a time that the bench began to get depleted. And, And a student came from the stands and went and sat on the bench All right, he never entered the game, but he was so ready to enter the game that he came in and he sat down. And it's that tradition that has caused the Aggies as the the 12th man to stand the entirety of the game. And there is nothing like it when your entire crowd, when your entire uh, stadium comes together. A hundred thousand people all shouting at the same time. When we're on defense, we're whipping our towels and everyone is yelling at the top of their lungs and there is nothing like that home field advantage affecting the outcome of a game. Guys, that is just a drop in the ocean in comparison to what verse 10 tells us occurs every Sunday morning when the church of God gathers together. That when we sing together, that when we pray together, that when we give together, that when we gather around God's word to hear a word from him, that when we unite this picture of that which the world can't unite, but when we unite together, this diverse, compelling unity gathers together, it is unlike any other. Verse 10 tells us, look at verse 10. It's on the screen. Verse 10 tells us That the church is the manifold wisdom of God. 
the church. The manifold wisdom of God on display to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now try and wrap your head around that. The Bible gives you, at times, just a little glimpse of a heavenly drama that there are angelic creatures that look upon the earth as a drama unfolds. Angels, demons, Satan, authorities that are in opposition to God, angelic creatures and hosts that we don't even know about are watching the earth as a cosmic drama unfolds as God made man in his image and then they rebelled is the son of God becoming one of them and all of the cosmos held its breath as he died on the cross and then erupted in praise as he rose from the dead. And now they're watching as the gospel goes to the ends of the earth and as the gospel causes those who were spiritually dead to come to life. And as the gospel covers the earth, it forms these pockets, these communities of that which the world could never unite, that which the world is always divided. The gospel forms these communities that we call the local church. And as they gather together, the cosmos, angelic beings and authority look on with great anticipation and curiosity. No angel was ever saved from their sins. They look upon and verse 10 tells us the manifold wisdom of God is on display in the local church. This, right here. Look around. Us. This gathering is the manifold wisdom wisdom of God, that when we sing, when we pray, when we gather around the Word of God, heavenly hosts watch with anticipation. For thousands of years, kings and authorities have tried to stop the gathering of Jesus' people. House church leaders in China describe a common scenario when the security police are harassing believers where their house churches are meeting. If you do not stop these meetings, we will confiscate your house and throw you onto the streets. Do you want my house and my farm? Well, you need to talk to Jesus because he owns this property. Well, we can't get to Jesus, but we can get to you. You and your family will have nowhere to live then we will be free to trust Jesus for shelter and daily bread. If you keep this up, we will beat you. Then we will be free to trust Jesus for healing. Well, then we will put you in prison. Well, then we will be free to preach the gospel and the good news of Jesus to captives and to set them free. We will be free to plant churches in prison. Well, if you do that, then we will kill you then we will be free to go to heaven and to be with Jesus forever. You see, for thousands of years, the saints have laid down their lives for the right to gather together, to assemble, because the King of kings and the Lord of lords has established his church. This 
Not the building, us, the gathering, his body, his bride, a living temple, what we do, and we can do it anywhere. God's just blessed us with the resources in order to build a magnificent and stimulating environment. But we can gather anywhere. We are the church. The outworking of the gospel in our lives, our call to bear one another's burdens, to love each other, to be patient with each other, to be forgiving, that unity that exists all across this room. And as the gospel goes out, for us to unite in purpose and to shine our light collectively as we take the gospel to our community, to our neighbors, as far as we can go. The Bible says that that is the manifold wisdom of God on display. How magnificent is that? You see, what is so compelling, church, is that we are not fans. We are the game. We are the game. We are on the field. What we do matters that much. And this morning, it stretches your mind. Do you think about the local church in this vein, in this manner? When you got up this morning, did you contemplate that heavenly beings are anticipating the gathering of us together because God's glory is on display when we gather together? I mean, you guys are going to get me pretty excited about this church thing. <laughs> guys, church matters. It matters. And if you genuinely read the scripture, you will be greatly stretched about how we view gathering ourselves together. Now, there are two applications that I want to unfold out of this. First, there is a collective purpose that you can't do alone. In fact, God intends for you to find that purpose in the body of Christ. Now, if we're honest... Our Western individualism has clouded our view of the church. We walk around with our chest out, say, you know what? I can read. Priesthood of the believer, right? I can read. I can feed myself. I can watch my favorite pastor online. I can pop in podcasts. I can learn lots of things. I can put in my favorite worship music. I am a self-sufficient Christian, I don't need the church. You see this picture? This picture of unity in the midst of diversity? The uniting of bricks next to each other that the world will never unite? It's something you can't do on your own. Only collectively. We paint this picture as we get to know each other as we dialogue as we rub shoulders with one another it's why I'll press you always to get into a growth group that you just coming in and, and meeting with just your little family unit and leaving it doesn't ever accomplish this picture we call this discipleship it's what happens when believers rub shoulders and walk step in step with one another. And you can't accomplish this on your own. Secondly, what, what we do together as the gospel shines out from here is far greater than anything you could ever accomplish on your own. Our light together is brighter than your single candle. 
Let me give an example. Just last week when we had our Yucatan fundraiser for our youth mission trip that's going there this summer, we raised $8,000 together for lunch. All right, the most we've ever raised. Now, we did that collectively. But what you must understand, it's so much more than just about the money. You see, we've had a partnership with pastors and churches in Yucatan that's developed on 18 years. 18 years, churches partnering together, planting churches, encouraging and building the body. We go continually year after year, and it shines a bright, bright light. Something that we do together. And we have those partnerships all over the globe in India, in Moldova, in Uganda, and even here locally with our local mission partners at Hill Country Daily Bread, at uh, Take It to the Streets, at uh, all these different partnerships that we have. We do that together. And when we do that together, it's brighter and it's greater than you could ever imagine. You don't have this purpose. It's the beauty of the local church. Paul is in prison, writing this letter, laying down his life for the local church, and he writes in verse 13, don't you consider my afflictions a worry at all? I don't want you to worry one iota about the afflictions that have come upon me. Why? Because he is so excited to pour out his life as an offering for the local church. For the local church. Because the local church is the gospel made visible. It is the glory of God on display. The apostle Paul says, I am happy to pour out my life for the local church. It matters that much. Listen to me. You are called to find a purpose that is so much deeper than your individual gifting. You are called to find that purpose in your connection to the local body of Christ. And scripture teaches you that you have been given spiritual gifts that Christ has uniquely gifted you for the body and the way that that fits together. And then what we can do together as a body is greater than anything you could ever imagine. There is a purpose in us being together. So now let me press you. Do you believe that it is your responsibility to build a healthy First Baptist Bernie? Your responsibility. Not that's the pastor's job. Is it your responsibility to build a healthy First Baptist Bernie? Secondly, an application from this text, there is an underlying issue that I need to talk about that undergirds the way that the scripture speaks about the local church. And it's gonna step on your toes a little bit, so here we go. There is an authority in the local church that is contrary to our Western mindset. An authority in the local church What's the difference between a Bible study and church? You ever thought about that question? In both, you can pray. In both, you can study the Bible. In both, you can sing. You can even do service projects together in your Bible study. So what's the difference between a Bible study and the local church? The answer is authority. That there is a God-given authority to the local church. In your Bible studies, you can come and go as you please. You can say, you know what, this isn't my favorite study. I think I'm going to try a different class, or I'm going to sit this one out. Okay? You can be, you can move in and out. But once you begin to step into and join a local church, 
you are simultaneously submitting to, voluntarily, an authority when we gather. You are joining a body and you are submitting to an authority of the local church gathered. An authority that you allow in your life. The local church has the ordinances given by God to the local church. The first of which is baptism. The declaration, it is a picture of the gospel that we as the local church get to picture the gospel by saying, I've been born again. Dead into the water, raised to newness of life. That you've been spiritually reborn. And we do that collectively, together, a corporate reality because it is your entrance into the local church. We also have the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, which also is a picture of the gospel. The body and the blood of Christ. And we take the Lord's Supper together, collectively, as the Bible instructs. Not on a camping trip with Dr. Pepper and marshmallows. Why? Because we are a body, a family. And there is an authority that has been given to the local church in the way that we meet together. Jesus has given his authority to the local church. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Jesus has left his kingdom keys to the kingdom with the local church. Not to any nation or king or any group of sophisticated leaders. The keys of the kingdom to the local church. Listen, I know that this conversation at this point could go a million different directions and your mind may be racing. But what I want us to focus on is I want you to, I want to show you that there is a congregational authority in the local church, that when we gather together here, right now, that there is a congregational body authority that Jesus has set upon you. That we are not a club, we are not a business, we're not a hobby, we're not a bowling league. That when you join a local church and you join together into the body, you are submitting to this corporate authority that Jesus has placed upon all of us. Let me give you two quick examples from Scripture. It's going to blow your mind. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there is a man who is caught in gross sin in the church. He is sleeping with his stepmother. And Paul writes to that church. He doesn't write to the elders, the pastors. He doesn't write to any leadership board or any of that. He writes to the local church, the congregation, and says, how have you not mourned this sin that is right there in front of you? How are you ignoring this He's passionate. He's desperate. He says, when you guys gather together, you bring that one in front of you, and if he still will not repent, then you have to vote him out. And that's what they do. They actually gathered together, and they took a church vote and said, you are going to be treated as if you are lost. You are not walking with Jesus. You say, Pastor, how do you know they voted? 
Well, if you read in 2 Corinthians, it said the decision made by the majority, which means people had to know who was a member and who was not a member, who was allowed to vote and who was not voting, and then they tallied the votes. That's the only way you get to a decision by the majority. If you want to know how it plays out, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, after he was removed, Paul writes and says, he has, received, he has repented and his discipline has been enough. Allow him back in the body. Second example. The, the, the letter that we call Galatians. Paul writes a letter to the church in Galatia. In this church, their church has been infiltrated by a false gospel. Judaizers have come and began to teach that the only way you can be saved is if you follow the law of Moses. This is a first-tier salvation issue. How are you saved? Okay? Paul writes, again, does he write to a group of leaders in the area? Does he get all the biblical scholars and say, let me talk to you guys first as we're gonna work out this teaching to make sure that we get the gospel right? No. You know who he writes to? He writes to the church, to the congregation. And he says to the church, how could you have let the gospel slip away? How could you do that? You have to hold, you have to fight. He held the church responsible for making sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ was proclaimed. Isn't this magnificent? That when we gather together that there is a corporate authority that we hold one another accountable, that we unite together, that we do the one another's to each other, that we bear one another's burdens, that we uh, pray for one another, that we are patient with one another, that all of that exists and that the congregation has the authority and responsibility to make sure the gospel is preached. So now do you see why the Bible begins to stir up and to teach how important, how magnificent is the gathering of the local church. We're, we're not just a club. We're not just something you kind of move casually in and out. It's not something you can say, yeah, take it or leave it. You know, I can, I can watch podcasts. No. There's a purpose. There's an authority in what we do every Sunday. The first day of every week as we gather to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel made visible. The manifold wisdom of God on display now, I know what some of you in the, in the room are thinking this morning. You're thinking, uh, Pastor, it's my first Sunday, and that is pretty intense. <laughs> you know, I just came to see if there was a spot in the choir, and suddenly you're talking about... It reminds me of a time uh, I, I had a buddy went on a, a, a date in college, and he came back just weirded out. And he was like, she wanted to talk about how many kids I wanted on the first date. <laughs> Let's take a step back, right? So look, I know that there are many different flavors of churches that we are not everyone's cup of tea, okay? I also know that you have a family and that there are so many different dynamics of joining a church and getting plugged in and making sure you're fed and you feel comfortable and you've got your space, right? So I get all of that, all of it. But here's where I want to press every single one of us. Once you have tasted and explored, once you've gone on many dates with churches, <laughs> all right, and once you get to that spot where you figure those things out, 
at some point you have to stop dating the church. At some point you have to stop dating the church. At some point you have to, it is right for me to press you. I don't know if it's your first time here, we're just glad you're here, right? At some point it is right for me to press you and to show you and to disclose the incredible picture that the Bible paints for the local church and what we are called to be about. At some point it's right for me to look you square in the eyes and say, do you believe it is your responsibility to build this and to help us and to go and to shine our light together? Are you willing to fight for her? Are you willing to find your purpose in our corporate purpose? At some point, it's right for me to press and to say those things to you. During VBS one year, a a pastor's wife stumbled upon a, a great picture of what the church is. She was teaching her second grade class, and about an hour before dismissal, A a young man came in, he was a visitor, and he only had one arm. His name was Josh. And while she began to teach, you could imagine her mind race. She didn't get the ability to prep the class or warn them, make sure that they were going to receive him kindly. And in her mind, she she was nervous. I, I hope none of the class members say anything inappropriate that would discourage him. She nervously and cautiously finished up her lesson. And as she began to close, she said to the class, hey class, let's let's finish the way that we do every week. And she said, let's form our churches. So put your hands together and here is the church and here's the steeple, open it up. And to her horror, she realized what she had done. She was worried about all the other kids and she's the one who had, and she stood there silent. Right there in that quietness, the little girl who was sitting next to Josh took her left hand and joined it with Josh's right and said, hey Josh, let's form the church together. Church, if there's anything I'm saying to you this morning, that's exactly it. Let's form the church together. And if there's anything I want you to say to another on the other side, all across this building, it's let's form the church together. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for, we thank you for this picture of what you are doing in our lives and what we are doing together as the local body. Father, help us to think rightly. Jesus, help us to think rightly as your body, as your bride, that you have laid your life down. And God, it was your unfolding plan that we would be the temple. Father, we want to love your church well. I pray all across this room that individuals would know their spot and their purpose in the body and that we would dream together about how to better care for one another and how to reach out into our community together collectively shining the light of Jesus Christ all for the glory of your name Jesus so that all might know what you've done in our lives and that they too can join and be born again we pray all of this in Jesus name Amen